Tom Panos, welcome to Property Insights, mate. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. I know you've got plenty to say, and I've got plenty to say. You and I have been fairly um, noisy over the last, uh, particularly the last three or four months. Um, mate, what do you reckon is going on out there? Um, this Reserve Bank, they continue to put interest rates up, and there might even be some more rate rises, given what happened in the UK last week and given what hap- what's happening in the US. They, they continue to rate, r- raise the rates. Um, my personal view on it is they continue to raise the rates until they break something, and they're looking to break something. How do you feel about it? What do you think? Richer getting richer, poorer getting poorer. That's, that's what's really clear about it. So, Mark, when I run my auction business, I do all of Sydney. So in a matter of two hours, I can go from the east, you know, west or north, out to the western suburbs. Our western suburbs, they're suffering. They're suffering. People are basically now budgeting on a day-to-day basis to make sure that they don't miss any mortgage repayments. Yet on the other side of the equation, out in certain parts where people have got no mortgages, they're, they're tossing and turning whether to go business class or first class to Europe this year, <laughs> whether to pay 20 or 35 grand. Out there, I visited my parents last week. I visited for Mother's Day the other yesterday, but last week. And this lady comes out. They've got a unit. They bought for 450. They can't afford the loan repayments because when they got the loan, they were paying 1.9. Now they're paying, I think they told me, three times as much. And they said to me, we, 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 can we sell it and get our money back, even if we get our legals and, and our stamp duty back? So um, they're suffering out there, Mark. I mean, do, you, do you buy the argument, though, this is the argument, inflation, and the RBA government has said it quite a few times, the inflation is worse on the standard of living of Australians than high interest rates are. Do you buy that argument and do you buy the fact that he's playing God, making a decision who's going to suffer the most? I don't buy that. And the reason I don't buy it, Mark, is 35% of households have a mortgage, 65% don't. At the moment, he has one tool, one weapon. As I said to you off air, it's no different to a carpenter that has got one tool, which is a saw. Everything he says, I just that's that's the one thing. And I, and I think it's not working because I think what you've got is this vulnerable group of people who may have overextended themselves with the influence of the RBA. Certainly the encouragement. Encouragement. No, that's a better word. Yep. That's a better word. I should have used that word than influence. With the encouragement. And this vulnerable group of people um, are now faced with a situation where their, their, their mortgages, not only uh, which they bank weren't going to ha- go up till 2024, they've actually gone up 11 times in like you know 10 mu- 12 months. So um, I think the strategy is that, hey, let's keep putting rates up. Let's keep putting rates up. But you keep impacting more than anyone, tenants, because when rates go up, rents go up, and you're impacting people that are going to make mortgage repayments. What you're not impacting is the wealthiest group of people in Australia, ones that are debt-free. Yeah, but people have paid their loan off, yeah. may even have money on deposit. They're actually making more money now than Correct. they've ever made because the interest rate they're getting from the bank is greater than ever before. Correct. So, uh, And also they might have invested in a few properties. They might be a landlord. Correct. And they might be jacking the, the rents up as well. So what you're saying is, and I, I agree with you, I don't buy the argument. Maybe in the past it was correct. But I don't buy the argument. But it's a different kind of inflation. So, so Mark, if you think about it, the inflation here, most of the things that are expensive, it's because, oh, mate, I'm going to have to wait a year and a half to get my Toyota Corolla uh, sent out from um, um, overseas. Everything's got to do with the, the demand, and a lot of it was caused by the COVID logistic issues, right? So it's not a... Supply stra- chain. Supply chain. It's not a straight out inflation that we've had in previous years where that's the problem, that's caused it, that's what's going to fix it. What about this um, discussion that, um, and I've seen the Reserve Bank, not the governor, but the Reserve Bank, some of the, uh, um, you know, his colleagues in the Reserve Bank put out articles saying, well, during COVID, Australians pay down their home loans at a faster rate than ever before. And that, I think the number is 50% of all Australians are at least two years ahead of their scheduled repayment cycle. And um, Australians saved a record amount of money of 250 billion during that period. 
do you buy that argument? In other words, we're we're well stocked, we're prepared, we're able to handle these interest rate rises. Uh, partly because I'd say there comes there comes a time. It might not be three months. It might not be six months. It might not might, might be a year. But eventually. It sort of adds up, and you know that there's normally a bit of a lag between uh, rate rises and impact to someone. Um, so May 2022 to today, they've gone up 11 times. If you'd said to me... And four of those were five, five, 50 base points. Correct. So that's like six... To me, it's like 16 times. Correct. Correct. So, Mark, the answer is yes. But not for a year. And if this keeps going and it becomes a one and a half year... We will year, have all spent our money. Correct. I mean, you must see it now, Mark. I'm seeing it because I talk to a broad base of people. Um, and I've got to tell you, we're so lucky in real estate. Because if you look at the volume chart, example, last Saturday, there was 300 less auctions in Sydney than what there was same time last year. In Melbourne, there was 600 less auctions. So we're fortunate in pricing that the supply of, of stock has been low. If that supply of stock had been higher, and I reckon springs the worry this year because all this stock that comes onto the market at the moment, we're protected, uh, low, low listing levels. When those stock levels go up, I'm worried that property prices can cop it. Okay, so that, that's a good point. So, so we've, you know, in terms of property price reduction um, from trough, uh, peak to trough, we're looking, I mean, I saw the national numbers that came out of the ABS or the RBA or someone like that. We're looking at around about nationally, this is not, some states are better or worse than others, but let's say nationally, about 11.7% reduction from peak to trough. And that trough, that's more recently. And then, of course, over the last couple of months, we've seen a little increase, a small increase nationally. Mm. Nothing to write home about, but it certainly wasn't, you know, devastatingly falling. And as you say, the um, and part of the reason for that isn't because people are feeling confident, I don't think. It's because investors have come back in the market because they know they can get better rents. But, 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 but also part of the reason for that is that there are very few properties for sale because property prices relate to supply and demand. Mm -hmm. A bit like the reason we had COVID inflation, mm -hmm. supply was down, <laughs> prices went up. Correct. Demand didn't increase. Correct. Supply decreased. Correct. I'm thinking the same here in the property market. Demand has not increased. In fact, they've done everything they can to kill demand off with interest rate rises. But supply has decreased, which can keep prices um, false, falsely high. So you're now saying that you expect at some stage later this year for that supply number to increase, go back to normal. Because there comes there comes a, a, a time, Mark, where there's a tipping point where people at the moment people are saying, the market's not good. I'll hang on. I'll hang on. I'll hang on. But on the other side of the equation, you got people that have not been looking at their mortgage for a decade who all of a sudden they're looking at their mortgage and they're saying, okay, how's this all going to stack up, right? So the pain is starting to be felt. That means that we're going to have properties that are going to come onto the market. When we have those properties come onto the market, um, um, we're going to see... Like, I'll give you an example. So I use an app called CoreLogic RP Data on my phone, you know, RP yep. Data. Yep. There's a simple thing. You press market. I can go to every suburb and have a look at volume this year for 12 months versus volume last 12 months. Volume's a key number in real estate, Mark, because real estate agents get paid on volume. Yep. They don't care that much about growth. Like, it's minimal. It's yeah, yeah. volume. So let's pick a suburb that we both both know, Byron Bay. Volume is down, get ready for it. As of, I checked it on Friday, 50%. So half the amount of properties are being transacted. Newtown, 15%. Quakers Hill, around 20%. So you're getting these low volume areas. But I will say this, Mark. You know that number, that national figure of peak to trough? Adelaide and Perth Doing well. are in there. Yeah. So that's not really 11 because you yeah. take Perth and Adelaide in there. Yeah. Melbourne and Sydney have been more like 15, 20% yeah. peak to trough, right? Yeah. You've, got to, you've got to take that into no, account. That's why, that's why I was saying national, but you're right because yeah. Adelaide and Perth are not affected. No. So uh, the issue is that um, the, the main equation I look at is the demand and supply 
curve because I know when someone sells in isolation, not a lot of stock, they do well. When they sell in competition and there's, like right now, you go to Greenacre, there's 45 properties that they could pick. Is that of, normal? It's more. More than normal. It's, it's, it's more than normal. So what I'm noticing is the lower socioeconomic the area, the more the stock's coming on. Right. As I said to you off air, St. Mary's. I spoke to Peter Diamantides, Ray White St. Mary's. And I said, have you got any mortgagee sales? He goes, are you serious? He goes, I've got a lot of mortgagee sales. I go, well, I don't see it on your ads on realestate.com. He goes, we don't put it on. Our instructions are not to put the word mortgagee. As a banker, you'd know that, yep. you know, you'd, there are reasons why people don't do that. Well, the reason you don't do it because everyone comes and tries to flog the flog the price down. So Correct. And uh, and it's not a good look as uh, if you're the lender, it's not a good look for you because it looks like you've lent to somebody who can't afford to make the repayments. Correct. And uh, so there's a lot of face saving going on in that regard. Tommy, what, given that vendors, which is, Real estate game is to find vendors, okay? It doesn't, you don't need to find buyers. Buyers always come. You need to find vendors. Um, and because you get paid by the vendor, not by the buyer. What is it, and you must be doing this analysis, what is it that you're analyzing will tip vendors back into the market and say, oh my God, I've got to sell. Now, as opposed to, wow, I'm not saying the market's going to take off and the vendors all say, wow, let's jump in on this bull run because we're not going to get a bull run just yet anyway. Um, what is it you think will make buyers, uh, vendors come back to the market? Okay. So there's two kind of vendors that go and sell. There's the want to and the have to. Want to and the have to. The want to, like there's a lot of vendors that want to, but the issue that they have is because low levels of stock mean that if they sell their house, they don't know where they're going to go. Right. But on the surface, Mark, it's actually not a bad time to do an upgrade because markets come down. If you're upgrading, a lot of the times the one you're going to buy has dropped more than the one you're going to sell. The gap gets smaller, the changeover. But what they're saying is there's no stock. So they 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 have to. So what will happen? So ha hang on, mate. Mum and dad yeah. at home. Husband, wife, young couple, whatever. Oh, let's sell this property to buy a better one, bigger place, whatever the case may be, different area, closer to schools. Yeah, but like we can't sell our joint because where we want to go, there's nothing for sale. That, that's a conversation. Correct. Right. What changes? Okay, how do we change that dynamic? Um, when more stock hits the market, like the more stock brings the more stock. Right. So I think that you'll see that in August, September, where there'll be options there. Because we do get a seasonal lift in listings regardless of economic factors, yep. right? So we know that September is a major listing month, you know? Yeah. Um, I remember uh, the old Wentworth cruise to get about four times as thick. Yeah. I, I used to know it was September or just about September. So when, so Mark, when it was known, when Rupert was in, so Rupert used to come in, so I worked at News Corp, as, as you know, when Rupert used to come into town, right, to... Um, to do budgets. He actually used to come into town to visit his mother, but then he'd come in and say, I'll, I'll, I'll do budgets and that. Everyone knew, get Panos, the September Wentworth Couriers, because when I was sitting in front of him, you got 30 minutes to do your thing. I just put these thick, vogue-looking books because they were really, really thick, you know, and, you know. And quite beautiful too. They were, <clears throat> they were. And it's actually, we used to call it real estate porn because it was aspirational. Yeah. Because what it used to do, Mark, it would get someone that was in a $3 million house and then consider go to a, a $7 million house or the seven to go to a $12 million house. That there, that there, I think will start happening. And then you've got the second group of people, the have to sells. They're growing by the month. They're growing by the month, right? And how do I know it? Um the occasional auction conversation I have with vendors that say, I'm not happy with the price I'm getting, but I have no choice. Those kind of conversations are growing just the last few months. So I think those rates compounding layered and layered are now beginning to have an effect on sellers and distress selling is happening. Do you think there'd be many people out there, Tommy, that um, haven't sold yet because they're still on the fixed rate and um, they're probably, they, they could be an investor or an occupier. They're on the fixed rate 
and it's quite low. It's lower than 2%. Then, because, you know, that fixed rate didn't commit start until 1 March 2020. It expired on 1 March 2023, but it, 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 each person's loan expires as you drew it down. So if it, you know, if I could have got the money, if I got the money in 2022 or 2021, therefore I probably got another, I potentially could have another year or a year to go on my fixed rate. So they're not going to be under any pressure. In fact, they're quite happy because they're probably getting, if they're an investor, they're probably getting very good rents, very good rents. And they're, and then if I'm an owner occupier, I'm paying not that much in terms of mortgage payments. So as maybe part of the thesis in terms of resupply of the market is what is the percentage or what are the number of people who have fixed rate mortgages? And it's 1.25 million people. Um, 850,000 of them expire this year, 400,000 expire, 400, expire next year, 2024. Um, as they, and they can only expire after 1 March. They could not have possibly um, have that 2% before March because it wasn't available on March this year. So uh, we're only in May, um, we're only two months in. So those are just starting to expire now, but the bulk of them will happen, say, later this year, this calendar year. Do you think that might be part of the thesis of an increase in supply? Because people are going to go, shit, we were okay before, we're not okay now. You're spot on, Mark. And I hadn't thought about this until last week when, by coincidence, three people that don't work in real estate in the same day asked me the same more or less question, which is, do I reckon rates are going to come down at some point in the future? And all three people had one thing in common. They're on a fixed rate. They haven't expired. One's expiring in December, one's expiring in January, and one I couldn't remember, but let's call it roughly that period. So what's fascinating is this mortgage cliff that we've been talking about for three, four months. There's not many people that have been impacted as of May. Yeah. Right? Like I, I don't run into people that say, oh, Tom, my variable rate, you know, is now six. So there's a group of people that now have to make a decision because they're three to six, maybe nine months away from having their rate tripled. And um, I think that that can definitely be uh, one of the factors, uh, Mark, on whether there's going to be an increase in, in supply. Well, I, I, I would, I mean, I agree there will be an increase in supply. I probably not, I probably wouldn't say, I probably wouldn't agree with you on September. I think there'll be increases in supply in September, but I don't think it'll be such that it'd be like big, thick, went with courier days. Um, but I do think towards the end of this year, because I, I quickly did a silly calculation, and it's not nothing's linear, but I, I said if there are 750,000 people who are going to come off the mortgage, fixed rate mortgages this year from March, let's assume it's linear, it's one twelfth per month, um, around 60,000 um, people each month are going to come off. And uh, some of those might be able to afford the new variable rate, some will be able to afford the new variable rate. Um, and I just took a percentage, you know, like I, I thought, well, maybe let's say 20% can't afford it. So that's 12,000 people who are gonna be put in the in the, in the the squeeze. And uh, it'll probably take them a couple of months to realize it. They'll probably have a crack for a couple of months, do their best, you know, stop sending kids to this and that. And, you know, because Australians tend to do that, we tend to reduce all our expenses mm. as opposed to selling our property. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe you know, of that uh, of that twenty uh, percent, maybe half of them can afford to hang out, just sell their car or get a cheaper car, whatever the case may be, and uh, and just grind in. Um, so we're sort of looking at about three thousand properties with a lag period after the fixed rate kicks in or the variable rate kicks in, a lag period of six months. I'm sort of thinking maybe later this year, later this calendar year, not beyond September. September definitely will be a seasonal increase. But I reckon the hurt's going to come around about November, December when you can't sell property. <laughs> I reckon if the Reserve Bank doesn't reduce rates and stays the course, that January, February, March next year is when we're going to see a lot more supply. And I'm going to, I think it'll be more, I think it'll be the February recommence. You know how everything recommences in February? Everyone's going to come back from holidays. You know, they've spent too much, they're going to get their insurance premiums, the school fees are up, there's kids got stuff to buy, and uh, you know, there'll be, a, I think it's going to be a big supply of property on the market. The question will be, will the Reserve Bank change rates before then? What do you reckon? Because there are some commentators out there saying, 
interest rates are going to start coming down towards the end of this year. And I, in fact, I saw uh, Bill Evans, the chief economist from Westpac, saying last week that they're expecting interest rates to start to reduce by the end of this year. And he's actually saying seven or eight reductions. So if I'm a one of these people on fixed rate, looking at the variable rate, that's coming to come in February. Uh, it's going to ha- my variable rate is going to kick in in October. I'm thinking, shit. I'm just going to sit here hoping maybe the Reserve Bank will reduce rates, and my new variable rate will be much more affordable, and I won't have to sell. Mm. What do you think about that thought process? Because it's very complex. It's very quite complex. It's very complex because on the one hand, you do have um, Bill Evans and uh, a large number. In fact, uh, the Fin Review the other day had 36 out of the top 38. Uh, 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 economists, I think they were, make a prediction. They have delayed their... Originally, they actually thought rates would come down uh, quicker. They've now delayed their forecast, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, whilst they're saying that, we clearly also know you've got the Reserve Bank who... It's not just the rate rise that they give you each meeting that they have. It's the commentary, and they keep alluding to this 2 to 3% infl- inflation rate band, right? So that's the one thing in my head that I'm thinking... I, I mean, I've seen, like, all this work we've done with 11 rate um, uh, rises, I've just seen the minimal effect it's done on inflation. So I'm thinking to myself, man, 2 to 3%, like, is that, like, six months away that we're going to get rates coming down? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so, Mark. Um, it's it's not my feeling, but I can tell you there are two types of vendors out there. There's going to be the ones that do the preparation work and they're going to say, you know what, like you are right now. You are right because the three conversations I had are people doing what you're thinking and they're saying, is that going to happen? They're, 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 they're working out, right? Is that going to happen? They're trying to game the system. Correct. Correct. Pretty dangerous. Oh, well, I think you're, you know, when you, you know, betting against banks and governments are... Uh, uh, not great bets, are they? Not, not really. But I mean, at the end of the day, you, you, you're, but you are betting the house. Mm. So you've got to think it through. Yeah. The old days, we just go, oh, shit, it's too expensive amount. I'll, I'll sell. We had no insights into what the Reserve Bank was doing. We had no media to read or listen to. They didn't have someone like you talking for them to listen to you as to what Tom Panos is saying and various other commentators. There was very little information out there for families to make decisions. There is a lot of information out there, but sometimes I wonder whether there's too much information out there and then just not equipped to make the decision. It's probably more confusing. But what it does, in an economic sense, it creates longer lags. So the lag period for, a, for the population who is affected, which is mortgage holders, the lag period is longer before they start to make decisions as to what they're doing. And one of the things we're experiencing now, which is not normal, is this lack of property for sale, mm. which is artificially keeping prices up. Mm-hmm. Well, not artificially. That's what happens when you've got mm. demand sort of greater than supply. It's not artificial. It's real. So, but, um, but, but it's not normal. That's probably what's better way of saying it. It's not artificial, but it's definitely not normal. In normal in the sense of numerically normal. You know, we would normally get nearly double the amount of properties up for auction on a weekend, mm. um, which compared to what we're getting at the moment, you just mentioned 300, 600, 900. And if we've got 900 properties on the market for auction, um, that normally would be 1,800 or a couple of thousand actually, because you've got to add in Brisbane and other places. So, Correct. Um, it's, it's very interesting. So I think we're in a, right now, in a bit of a hiatus where we're sort of, you know, we, we're no man's land at the moment. And what bothers me is the Reserve Bank goes, oh, well, property prices haven't gone down. We haven't broken anything. Let's put the rates up again, which I reckon was part of the decision to put the rates up last time, was because the property market yes. didn't fall. Yes. And I think they've gone, well, hang on a minute. We've got to break this system. I believe they feel as though they've got to break something yes. before they stop. Yes. And they haven't broken anything. Yes. What they have done, what, if they bothered to go out and ask people, they've broken our spirit. Yes. They've broken Australian spirit. They've yes. broken Australian's dream about yes. owning a property when they've already bought something back off the back of what the Reserve Bank governor said. They've broken spirit. And for me, that's enough. What do you reckon, Tommy? So, Mark, in 2006, actually, when I'd, when I'd, 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 I'd met you and I was unwell the first time going through cancer, I'll never forget. I remember asking an oncologist, out of everything, what advice can you give me to try and work through this? He said, the number one factor, because I've been an oncologist for 35 years, the number one factor is the minute you lose hope, the game's over. 
when you break. Hope is a big thing with people, right? When they get sapped, you use the word spirit, but I put it along the same lines, where you become feel helpless, right? That's bad for a person. That's bad because they wake up and they think it's pointless, right? Um, and I think, Mark, you're right. I think the reserve... And I, I don't want to come across to um, your members as someone that is... Um, hates the Reserve Bank and hates Dr. Lowe. But my issue is you're spot on because what he's doing is he's had a look and said, oh, well, prices went up 1% in Melbourne and Sydney in the last um, last month, you know? Yeah, there's more room for, for, for rate rises. But if you go at a myopic, myopic level, if you look down and you look at pairs of sales, a house that was selling at the top for $2 million, is now selling for 1.6. One of the reasons, it stands to reason, every time there's a half a percent rate rise, borrowing capacity drops by 5%. Correct. Right? That's roughly the formula. That's right. right? 100% right. So there was a, a person that could have done $2 million in May 2022 is now at a $1.5 million. Yeah. So that $1.5 million person goes to the vendor and says, that's all I've got. Yeah. I, if I had more, I'd pay it. So I, I think what, what they're doing, the Reserve Bank is... They're not drilling down too myopically and saying, oh, uh, uh, um, Ali and Sarah from St. Mary's bought a property for 600. It's now worth 450. They can't afford the loan repayments. What he's doing is he's adding all these properties in Perth going gangbusters. Yeah. 10 million, $15 million houses, right? Going there, right? Um, they're adding all those figures there and they're making decisions on figures that can be misleading averages you know averages yeah. are very misleading yeah and, and that's and and I've, I've often said that's the the error of monetary policy when they rely too heavily on just the raw data they take data and they do and they've got all these you know people you know, 500 ec um, economists sitting in the rba do all this an analysis but they haven't actually gone and a worked at the human impact but B, it's about changing. All they're trying to do is change people's behaviour, all of our behaviour. Stop spending. And what I'll do, I'll make you pay more on your mortgage. Mm. That's what I'm doing. Yes. And, uh, well, if that's what you want to do, if you want to play the psychology game, well, go out and talk to people and find out how they feel. Because this is, don't, don't uh, try and play this game to change our psychology, our behaviour. And then in terms of deciding whether or not we've changed our behaviour, just apply data Actually ask us about our behaviour. How do we actually feel? Yes. Ask, actually, come and ask us. Yes. Or send a, don't send a, a data scientist out or a, an economist out. Yes. Send a psychologist out. Yes. And get that psychologist to come back and report to the Reserve Bank and say, wow, you've broken their spirit. Yes. Things will be okay over time. Yes. Because they're going to stop spending. What do you reckon? I think, Mark, I think you're absolutely spot on. The issue I have is spirit is more broken in some parts than other parts, right? So the problem that you've got is when you're looking at the spirit, listen, you know, I heard someone say the other day, out, 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 out west, and he turned there and goes, out west in Leichhardt. Well, mate, Leichhardt's not west, mate, right? Yeah, anymore. Right? right, it's not west anymore, right? You've got to go further out. You've got to go to Blacktown, right? You got to, that, that's, that's west. What I'm getting at is, the spirit, if you put a temperature thermometer into the spirit of the people there versus in the spirit of, say, someone in the east at the moment that's got a $15 million house with zero debt on it, right? You're going to get a different answer. It's killing me. I can't stand... What's happened here is they've, they've, they've adopted a system we're allowed to continually use a system that is dividing Australia. It's and, killing me, Tom. And, Mark, you know... You, you, you've come from the West. So you're able to have a, a foot in both camps, if you know what I mean. You get a, a more, you get a more broad-based view. I know what it's like. You know what it's like. You've been there. I heard yeah. you talk on a, on a podcast in the, about the early 90s yeah. and, and what, it, what, it, what it felt like for you. The, the issue that we've got right now, Mark, is that um, um, spirit 100% is broken more and more people are falling into the broken spirit category every time it happens. And um, I'm just really worried that the only way the Reserve Bank's going to stop if they turn around and they think, wow, that was a real hard landing. We've got what we've wanted. But 
it might not have to be that way, you know? Yeah. Um, well, we're going to have a new Reserve Bank, potentially a new governor in September, October this year, I think. Um, be interested to see what the new approach will be. And it's only a few months away. But it'd be interested to see what the approach is. And uh, what would you say to all those people out there struggling now, Tommy? What would you say to them? Um, a little bit of what you said um, a few weeks ago, and that is, well, I don't think you actually used the exact words, but it's okay to have to sell your property, right? It's okay. We, we get it. And I, and I feel for the vulnerable people because no one put a gun to their head, but they did encourage them. Yeah. They did encourage the most vulnerable people. They might not have put a gun to their head and say, take money and spend it, right? And they did it for two years. And now what they're saying is, you're going to have to pay for what you did. But many of them would not have done that without the encouragement. Correct. Right? So we're talking about vulnerable people who, who might not necessarily be getting good financial advice. These are the group of people that... Um, uh, always the most vulnerable in society, right? Uh, they might not have access to information, they don't have access to professionals to advise them. What I would say to them is it's it's totally okay for you to um, sell your property, forget about ego and pride. If on a practical level, it's going to be better for you, you should consider that. Um, the second thing is, thank God, there's a lot of side hustles or overtime at the moment, Mark. Yeah, plenty of work. Right, there's plenty of work, right? The third thing I would say is, now's not the time. I'd keep your car two more years. Now's not the time to go off and buy the car and do and do the upgrade, right? Because you're fighting with inflation, the logistic uh, chain problems of getting cars. You pay too much. Yeah, and, and and that's not just cars. It's holidays. You'll be you'll be you'll be paying significantly more to have a holiday, whether you're flying, you know, m m more overseas than than in, in a state. But even even within Australia, I would say do your damn best to get rid of ego expenses. Um, and even if it's a a basic, um, even if it's an accountant to sit down with them and say, listen, let's do some scenarios. If rates don't go down in February, what's our repayment going to be? Yeah. Right. Sit down and do situational analysis and say what happens there, because it helps you a lot, Mark, to be able to know I can cope with worst case scenario. But if you can't cope with worst case scenario, then I'd be selling. That's the best advice from someone who's a sage in terms of the property market. It's been around a long time. You saw it all, you've seen it all. Probably never been nothing like anything like this before, but you've seen it all before. And that's great advice. Thanks, Tommy. Tom Panos. Thank you so much, Good Mark. Good man, mate. Thank you.